friendship with Connie Menendez really was the, the catalyst uh, to begin this evening. I'm deeply grateful to Anna Menendez, who is, uh, whose generosity and openness uh, made the process of organizing this event a pleasure. And believe me, a number of our events are not a pleasure to organize. This, this, certainly, this certainly was. Uh, I'm very grateful to uh, Dr. Jorge Juane of the Cuban Research Institute Dr. Frank Moore of the Latin America and Latin American and Caribbean Center who contributed material to this event. Uh, to uh, James Sutton, uh, Dr. James Sutton of the English Department, Dr. Ashton Milbauer of the English Department and Exile Studies, uh, not only made tonight's uh, event possible, but they have been partners with the center in a number of very I'd like to, to thank uh, Dave Lawrence, who is going to be introducing our speaker, and who is one of the moving forces in Miami life, and has been for, uh, the, the, for, for decades. He is, a, he is an early and ardent supporter of the center, uh, a, a, a guide that I, that I deeply valued when I was beginning, and, and continue to value, both for his insight <laughs> both for his insight and, uh, and his generosity. I'd like to also offer uh, general thanks to um, uh, institutions here at FIU that have been a great support to the center, the, um, the College of Arts and Sciences, the uh, College of Architecture and Art, the Alumni Association, of course, uh, WPBT, uh, SU, uh, Public Television Miami, which records all of our events and uh, does them in a terrific way so that we have, we'll have a, a, a record of, of this wonderful evening and a number of, of, of other uh, evenings uh, available on the website. If you are not aware of the website, if you haven't uh, been getting announcements to events like the Ana Menendez presentation, before you go, please uh, leave your email address and I'll be sure you get facilitated, again, materially, this event and events at the center throughout the, uh, throughout the year. The, um, the, the, the week before spring break is going to be awfully busy for us. On Wednesday, James Webb will uh, talk about astronomy for uh, non-astronomers uh, at 7 o'clock in uh, GL 242, uh, I'm sorry, GL um, intimidated by the map and so didn't take astronomy for in college and then get a crash course uh, on, uh, on Wednesday. And then Friday, Richard Carney from Boston College will uh, give a talk on an atheism, the, the, uh, uh, the approach to God after the death of
I don't know why. Um, <laughs> this Thursday night, our linguistics program has their signature that we back at 6.30. Uh, so if you're here, I offer that the uh, their Barbara Gordon Memorial Lecture. And on Friday, the day after, uh, our linguistics faculty and a number of other uh, folks who are interested
just recently actually it's been uh, operated for just three and a half years. It is a program which is uh, housed in the English department and deeply anchored in literary studies. Uh, it is an interdisciplinary program because it also offers a certificate in exile studies, which is at the core of the exile studies program that requires speaking credits and the students are awarded a certificate and diploma at the end. To the best of our knowledge, this is the only program in fact in the States and probably in the world that offers a concentrated academic, academic certificate. The, the program also is very proud of hosting people like Ms. Menendez. Your visit comes on the heels of other lectures that we have. The Zimbabwean writer Chen Hovey was here a few months ago. We had uh, Edwidge Denticot come and address us. Uh, we had the president of Bart College, uh, Leon Boston, come and talk to us. So I hope you will accept it, that you're in good company. And we are in good company because you are here. So we look forward to this lecture. Uh, and uh, I know that my students and our students will benefit a great deal. And I hope that this will not be the last visit that you make to Miami. After all, you are a Miami. <laughs> it's not yet been a tornado, so I am a Miami. <laughs> uh, at any rate, I uh, don't want to pick up too much time. I just want to say a few words about um, Mr. David Lawrence, who will be introducing Anna, a former colleague of Anna. Mr. Lawrence is a nationally known newspaper editor and publisher of uh, leading national, and the leading national advocate for children, especially in the area of early childhood investment. He is the former publisher of the Miami Herald, as well as other papers among them, the Detroit Free Press. Currently, Dr. Mr. Lawrence serves as the president of the Early Childhood Initiative Foundation and Education and Community Leadership Scholar at the School of Education and Human Development at the University of Miami. He is a recipient of 12 honorary degrees, including one from his own alma mater, University of Florida. He received numerous awards for publishing, educational, and civic organizations. The IELTS <coughs> award, for example, in leadership and providing. I think we came here now. <laughs> Okay, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. So, let me give you some context for Anna Menendez on the non-academic plane. The very best journalists I've ever known are, first of all, quite extraordinary reporters. People who never ask too many questions. People who craft stories larded in lace with enormous detail. People who themselves read broadly and deeply. People with an enormous zest for telling stories, which in the case of Anna Menendez goes back to her teenage years, high school years at St. Brendan's in Miami where she regaled her friends with all sorts of stories that were not made up. And all that she has ever done since, in my estimation, has been done with great authenticity and great insight. She's been reading all her life, poetry as a child, the girl detective stories of Nancy Drew and Trixie Belden. You probably are not getting that in the literature classes at FIU, I don't think. In the teenage years, the stories of Judy Blooms, surely some of you read those stories, followed by the prose and poetry of Jose Marti, Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn, Faulkner Hemingway, the short stories of Alice Munro, and the list goes on and on. It's a mix of extraordinary fiction and nonfiction. She became a really first-rate newspaper reporter, and then a columnist. She never minced words, and she had a hunger for justice. Some of what she wrote made people uncomfortable, 
and they deserve to be uncomfortable. So just imagine how good a creative writing professor she must be at Maastricht University in the Netherlands. The students are fortunate to have her and we're fortunate to have her this evening. Someday I hope soon she'll be back full time in our midst and accompanied by Peter who is here tonight plus their three-year-old son, Peter, because as you've already heard, this after all is her real home. At FIU, where she received her bachelor's degree, followed by a master's in fine arts and creative writing at NYU. I just finished reading in Cuba, I was a German shepherd and simply loved the story she tells. The pain and poignancy, the dominoes playing, joke killing, widower. The stories about parrots and bananas and a mother's memory and a daughter's discovery. And yes, of a place you all know that she describes as, quote, that restaurant on 8th Street afloat in mirrors like the sea. In her adios happy homeland, I read passages that spoke to my own work in these years since the newspaper business. Stories about that touched on the lives and futures of children. She writes, for example, quote, that's how it is for children. They are always being acted upon. They are woken and fed and they are walked to school where they are then, for eight long hours, taught how to be. Children, she writes, are slaves of other voices. They've not yet mastered the first person singular and always are at the blunt end of someone else's dream. Elsewhere in this volume, she writes of a man who does not live here, a man whose name you know, a man who dominates Miami in many ways. At one point, she writes, Beatrice turned to address the rest of us and said, after I read this book, I completely understood what's wrong with us Cubans. We focus on the negative, on hate, on revenge. We constantly use words like tyrant, dictator, dungeon. We have dedicated our energies to thinking and living and breathing that man. So ladies and gentlemen, a very great talent, a really fine soul, someone with messages and meaning for all of us, our own Anna Menendez. Anna.
we had a lot of staff, we had a lot of foreign staff, and, and Dave had a lot of people to look after, and he made you feel like you were the only reporter at the Herald, and he was reading all your stuff. And he used to send out these little things called Dave Raves. And I was, I was looking for some today to bring, and I, in one of my many moves, I've lost them. Uh, but I kept them for years and years, and they were little notes that would come through inter-office mail, because of course we didn't really have email. And they would say, you know, good job on that article, and, you know, great profile. And they just <coughs> uh, filled, filled us with, with glee, because really it was difficult work. And it was nice that somebody of his stature was reading it and, and commenting. So thank you, Dave, and thank you for that introduction today. Um, well, I'm going to give a very informal talk. <coughs> Um, when uh, Michael and I started talking about uh, being here, thanks to Paula, because of Paula's generosity with her time, actually, because I had been in touch with her to set up a uh, writing center at Mastic University where I'm a professor. And I had been in touch with her just out of the blue, and she was so generous with her time. She had me meet her, her tutors here. She sent me a bunch of material, um, so thank you that and uh, and then through that I was able to meet Michael and Asher and all of these other wonderful people so when we talked about doing this talk they said well you can read a little bit and I said ah oh, you know it's kind of boring to read from the books when I started when I first started writing and um, went on tour my mother said you know whatever you do don't read from the book because that's boring and, <laughs> and I hate going to readings and people just read from the book so that's always in the back of my mind so what I'm gonna do instead, I will read a little bit from, from my latest book at the end, but I wanna give a little bit of an informal talk in the spirit of, of the invitation today, which is uh, about exile, about inherited exile, about uh, what it means to be what we are, most of us in this room, which is uh, exiles in one way or another. Um, and um, I, I'll, I'll start with stories because that's what I do. Uh, and I'll start by telling you a little bit about my own background my own uh, long line of immigrants. And I come from a long, long line of people who have fled. Um, my uh, great-grandparents on my mother's side fled from uh, Lebanon and Syria at the end of the, with the breakup of, that, uh, of the empire. Uh, they took a boat to Mexico and somehow ended up in Cuba and <coughs> said, well, this is fine. Uh, <laughs> this is you know, close, good enough or far enough, perhaps. Uh, my mother's father fled the poverty of Asturias when he was just a teenager. He, uh, family lore has that he took, got on a boat and just left and went to Cuba. Cuba was the new world, it was the promised land. And the family lore also says that he was shocked when he saw him. They didn't have mirrors in his house. And he was shocked when he saw himself in a mirror uh, for the first time on the boat and said, that little guy, that scrawny little guy has just taken off to a new continent. Uh, but he did, and he did well. And uh, on my father's side, uh, they also were fleeing uh, various uh, things, mostly poverty as well. Also from Asturias, from the Canary Islands, uh, and even, we believe, from Scotland uh, on my father's mother's side. So uh, they were in Cuba for a while, the Baraderos and Guinness and uh, Havana suited them for many years, happy years, until it was time to pick up and move all over again. And uh, I, my sister and I joked that if our family had a, a crest, the motto would be, this is bullshit, I'm out of here. <laughs> uh, exile is an inherited condition. I think those of us who are children of exiles know this, that it's uh, like blue eyes or nasty temperament. It's something that each generation uh, sort of unwittingly sometimes passes on to the next. Um, we, we do that first with stories and myths. And those are the easy things to pack. Uh, you can just uh, take them with you. They don't take up any room in the luggage. And you can tell them again and again and again. And um, for me growing up, uh, I grew up in the 70s. Uh, there was Vietnam War. There was Watergate, um, there was uh, all sorts of upheavals, social upheavals, social movements. I knew nothing of that. We did nothing of that in my house. All I knew was two polarities, 
Fidel Castro and Jose Martin. Fidel Castro was the evil, uh, supernatural being who I really believe could see us the way Santa Claus did. <laughs> Knew what we were doing, what we were talking about, uh, what we were up to. And Jose Marti was the saint in this polarity. And I think that in this sense, the world of the exile resembles the world of the child. Uh, both are thrust uh, unwillingly into uh, a new land that they did not desire and do not know. And the uh, subtlety, the appreciation for nuance, that comes later in, in repose and in, in, in happy times. In the beginning, there's only good and evil and a world of shadows that the exile, like the child, must learn to navigate. And so, I, I, growing up, I feared Fidel um, uh, as a supernatural being. And Jose Bacti was, was the light uh, that counterbalanced that. Because the, the power of poetry, uh, which I'm going to be reading uh, from different poets uh, in a little while, the power of poetry is on a different order. And it's, uh, for me, Mati was the musical cadence of childhood. It was the hope, the beauty, all the good things that Cuba is also capable of producing, not just uh, tyrant after tyrant. And his was the power of, of ideas, and more important for me as I grew older, of words. And uh, I, I no longer believe that Fidel could appear into our houses, thank goodness. But I still believe in Jose Mati. I still believe in the power of language and in the power of poetry. And I believe every year more and more Mati, who bent language to his will and gave a nation a sense of itself. And in a way, he was our first exile. He lived many years uh, in the monster, as they call it in the US. And uh, in that way, he's the godfather, our godfather of displacement. He wrote, in exile, men lose their moorings and find their bearings. We who were born in the US, as I was in Los Angeles, of uh, Cuban exile parents, uh, are also Mati's children. And we've inherited that feeling of displacement, of being from somewhere else or from nowhere, even though we're from here. And uh, that takes many forms. For, for a lot of us, uh, especially in my generation, it meant also adopting our parents' political beliefs, our parents' stories, our parents' ideas, uh, because to reject them it was worse than rejecting uh, our parents. It was worse than rejecting our heritage. It was a kind of a, of a disinheritance that was all the worst of a disinheritance because it signaled not freedom but the abyss. Without that, we had nothing. And even for those of us who believe that we've escaped that, uh, and sometimes I feel that I have, sometimes I feel that well, my parents' politics are not my politics, my parents' history is not my history. We still, I still, carry the DNA of flight within me. Uh, somewhere deep down, I know if things get really bad, I can always take off. And I don't call it cowardice, I call it adventure. <laughs> and I have, uh, I'll be 44 next month, and in 21 years, I've lived on, I've moved 16 times, and I've lived on four different continents. Uh, these days, I live in Maastricht, but we spend holidays, tend to spend holidays in Bratislava, where Peter's family is from, and birthdays in Miami. So there's, I'm still, still moving. And for, for a long time, I like to think of myself as a free spirit, you know, nothing can hold me down. If something gets bad, I just sort of wiggle out and, and start something new. Uh, but lately, I've been wondering just what it is that I'm running from. Uh, my maternal grandmother uh, died in 2010, and I want to talk a little bit about her because she was my last living grandparent. She was... Uh, the daughter of the Lebanese immigrants to Cuba. And she was a fantastic storyteller. And she, she died one day before I found out I was pregnant with my son. So that's always been um, 
one of the many regrets that we have with, with grandparents, I think, and one of them is that she just never got to know that. Um, so I tell stories about her as a way of, of conjuring her up and having her see me here again. And she was the great storyteller in the family. She could go to a trip uh, for Publix, to go to Publix for 15 minutes, and she'd come back with a story that took half an hour to tell. <laughs> Uh, all of us have people like this, right? These are the storytellers of the tribe. Right? And she, she was just a, um, a really great person. And my, I still have regrets, right? That I didn't ask her for more stories. That I didn't ask her for more recipes. Uh, and I, I think what a gift it is to be able to remember. And the, uh, I, I grew up with my four grandparents and I was fortunate that I had their stories. And the tragedy of uh, great terrors, the tragedy of Holocaust, uh, is, not, is, is measured in individual lives cut short. And its enduring tragedy is the silencing stories. And those of you who still have your grandparents with you, who are fortunate enough, your parents, your aunts, ask them stories. Tell them to tell you stories. Uh, this is what sustains us through so many journeys and so much movement. Um, Tonight, I'll tell you a little, uh, a couple of, uh, from my grandmother, as I said. She, <clears throat> she was a big fan of Tole Cuea. How many of you know this station? <laughs> uh, all the Cuban stations, they, uh, uh, she recorded them. She had uh, boxes and boxes of her favorite shows that she'd record on, on Tole Cuea. She was born, uh, she collected also funny names and funny faces from the newspaper. She would cut them out and she kept them in files. And I and I know I know authors who do this. Authors do this for characters. My grandmother just did this for fun. You know, she would have been a great writer if she would have had a different kind of upbringing. And um, she was born in 1925. Her parents, as I said, had fled, fled the bloody turmoil of the Middle East after the breakup of the Ottoman Empire. Um, they struggled in Cuba. He, my great-grandfather was a peddler in the countryside for some years uh, until he finally had enough, thank you, until he finally made enough money to open a butcher shop. They had eight children, and they made it a point to not teach them Arabic. Uh, they wanted their kids to be Cuban. They wanted their kids to speak Spanish. And for them, there was no going back. This was the kind of immigrant that used to be. And it was also the kind of immigrant that used to come to the U.S. And um, she married well. And she married my grandfather, that poor Asturian boy, who uh, made a lot of money in Cuba and uh, had a series of stores. He had property. And they lived very well and very nicely for a time until a uh, revolution cut that short. And it was time to pack up and move again, right? And this is also the story of the 20th century. Great migrations, great upheavals, uh, great tragedies, great reinventions, new wealth that's sometimes lost all over again, and then the movement starts over again. She, as soon as she became a citizen of this country, my grandmother never missed an election. She always voted Republican. And she also never learned English. So uh, Rep Representative Steve King, the Iowa Republican, uh, she was the kind of immigrant that he sought to protect again, America against. Right? He, he, in, when he introduced this latest round of English-only legislation, he said, we need to encourage assimilation of all legal immigrants in each generation. A nation divided by language cannot pull together effectively as a people. And the strange thing is that my grandmother probably would have agreed with him. She would have said, yeah, these Mexicans, if they want to stay, <laughs> they should learn English, right? But she and people of her generation were not planning to stay, right? She remained a citizen of an imaginary country that every year receded further and further right, into the past. There were practical reasons why she didn't learn English. Um, she had grown up poor in Cuba, made money, she had her, her cooks and her 
cleaning ladies and the nannies and so forth. And when she came to this, this country, my mother uh, started working at a plastics factory. She's still partially deaf in one year from that. And my grandmother, until she retired at 65, worked uh, in a sewing factory, sewing samples. So she didn't have a lot of time to learn English. Uh, she was raising a teenage, a teenager. My uncle was a poet, Camisa Martinez, who introduced me to Carl Sandburg and all the other poets that I read as a child. She was taking care of him. They were working. Um, she had barely a high school education, so sometimes if we don't understand how our own language works, it's harder to learn how a new one works. She was also crippled by anxieties triggered by the events of 1959, and that would stay with her for the rest of her life. Um, I still remember uh, my mother trying to teach her how to drive. And uh, this is something my sister and I can tell this story and leave the whole room in stitches, but it's actually tragic. You know, she just couldn't do it. She, she was so anxious. She, we're driving around Horizon Park in Tampa, and the car is lurching back and forth. And she screamed, and my mother screamed. She never learned how to drive. So learning was difficult for her. Uh, there were emotional obstacles to that. Um, but I think these explanations fall short because I think there was a deeper psychological reason. Uh, and that was that once she learned English, it meant that this was her country, this is where she was gonna stay, this is where she belonged, and she was now American. And though she loved this country, she was proud to call herself an American, she was still Cuban, and she was waiting to go back. Uh, as I said, one of my, in her last years, one of my grandmother's uh, great pleasures was shopping in Publix. And she didn't drive, so somebody would have to drop her off and then pick her up again. Uh, she, she'd come back with her stories, and one day she comes back really angry because she always, uh, she had her friends there, the cashiers, she, she always talked to them and chatted and she would return things and they would give it back to her. It was her, her you know, weekly outing was to Publix and she would always talk with these uh, cashiers who were usually Cuban or later from Nicaragua and then later from Colombia, you know, you can trace the migrations to Miami through the cashiers. And finally she, she comes back one day and she's, meow, she's kind of, well, what happened? And she said, yeah, there's a new cashier there. And I said, well, you know, what was wrong with her? And she said, nothing, you know, just, she didn't speak any Spanish. And she says, chica, esta gente viven in Miami, no pueden aprender un poquito de español. <laughs> These people live in Miami, they can't learn a little bit of English. So, uh, and she meant she, it was unironic, right? She really thought, you know, what are they doing here if they're not going to learn some Spanish and help me out here at Publix? I'm now roughly the age my grandmother was when she came to this country, which blows my mind. And uh, this is the age when you're still young, and I still feel young, um, but your options start to narrow, movement becomes more sluggish. Uh, this is the age when you realize, well, maybe I'm not going to ever become fluent in Mandarin. Uh, maybe I'll never become an astronaut after all. Right? Narrow options start to narrow. And I, I used to chide my grandmother for not learning English. And, and I was quite obnoxious about it. And, and you know, this, if you love this country so much, you know, why don't you learn English? You know, all your Republican friends, they want you to learn English. And, uh, you know, what are you doing all day? You know, why don't you learn English? And I said, you know, when I lived in Istanbul, I lived in Istanbul for two years, and I learned, I learned Turkish, and I did. I learned enough Turkish to, to speak and to, you know, have a conversation with, with the locals. So I was very proud of myself. But as so often happens, life humbles you. I grew older. I kept <coughs> moving as if I were still 25. And I uh, went to Cairo, ironically enough, to learn the language of my great-grandparents. And after a year in Cairo, uh, I yielded only taxi, uh, Arabic, you know, Yemin, Shamal, Alatul, you know, uh, and nothing more, right? And now I find myself, uh, is it the fifth year? Starting the fifth year in the Netherlands. And I've taken some classes uh, in Dutch. Um, I did an online course, I did a course with some people, great friends. 
but I still don't speak it well enough. In fact, I don't speak it at all. I can, I can understand a little bit, and, and that was necessary because we would be getting these uh, mailers from our child's school that we would put through Google Translate <laughs> and say they want to do what? <laughs> so we, we figured we needed to learn it well enough to, to not be outraged at the, the things that Google Translate said they were doing to our child. Um, <laughs> but I still, I still haven't learned it and I am thinking about why it is. Well, I have excuses, right? I have legitimate excuses. I, I, I work a, a demanding job. Um, I'm taking care of a three-year-old. It takes a lot of time. Uh, I also blame the Dutch. It's also their fault. Um, because they speak English so well that you'll, you'll go to a restaurant and uh, you'll start, Ik wil graag ein espresso. Yeah, yeah, you want an espresso. What else do you want? <laughs> perfect English. Also perfect Spanish, as I've discovered. I was uh, having lunch with a, a friend of mine who's Cuban and we are speaking Spanish, and then the waitress comes in perfect Spanish, and she says, where are you from? And we say, well, you know, blah, blah, we do the whole, you know, where are you from, Cuba, Miami, blah. And I say, where are you from? And she says, oh, I'm Dutch, oh. but I studied in Chile. And she spoke absolutely perfect Spanish, so it's also their fault, <laughs> because they speak very well. Um, but of course, if I'm honest uh, with myself, which I'm usually loath to do, uh, it's, there's a deeper reason for that as well, and that is now uh, with a family, uh, with a sense of who am I, where do I belong, uh, I am also waiting to come home. And as the years go on, uh, I, I realize that home for me is the United States. It's where, uh, it's my language, it's my um, cultural background, and, and I think this is one of the reasons why I haven't learned it. Uh, haven't learned, haven't learned Dutch. Uh, one of the many reasons that I love poetry is that it reminds us that we're not alone and also that we're not that special. And all of these things that I've been talking about today that the poets have treated, been treating and have treated beautifully for years and years and years. Uh, Zen poet Wang Wei, Wang Wei uh, who along with his contemporaries um, Li Po and Tu Fu was one of the greatest poets uh, of China's 3,000 uh, year old tradition. Um, David Hinton, who's a great poet, has made a beautiful translation of his work. And one of my favorites there is entitled In the Mountains for My Brothers. And it includes the line, in mountain forests I've lost myself completely. Identity is nothing but the role we play in public. And that, I love that line so much because it really speaks to what I feel about what my identity is. It depends on where I am, what I am. Uh, in, when I lived in India, I lived in India for three years, uh, I was Western. And then when I, I'd go up to Pakistan or to Afghanistan, I was woman. Um, in Miami, I'm Cuban, but in LA, I'm Latino. Uh, in New York, I'm whatever anybody wants me to be. <laughs> uh, and, and so this sense of, well, I am this, well, that, it's, so, it's so based on context. And my, this is something that was brought home to me with my mother uh, when she, she always, I always thought of her as very Cuban, my mother. And one day we were watching an interview with uh, uh, Lucio Ball and Desi Arnaz's children and he was talking about how he had this identity crisis that he didn't know if he was Cuban or if he was American. And my mom, after a moment, she said, yeah, I, I felt that way in Cuba. I, I didn't know if I was an Arab or if I was Spanish. I was shocked and I said, well, I mean, when did you become, you know, when did you feel you were Cuban, which is what I always thought of her as. And she thought about it for me and she said, when I moved to Miami. <laughs> And in fact, uh, Richard Blanco, who is a poet, the, the inaugural poet, and a fantastic human being, and, um, and, and, and just a wonderful person, uh, wrote this memoir of um, uh, writing the inaugural poem. I'm proud to uh, be a fellow FIU grad with him. And he talks about the same thing, where the Sandy Hook tragedy he says, the tragedy opened a new emotional and creative pathway for me. 
Writing the inaugural poem wasn't the same assignment anymore. I suddenly understood that as a Cuban American, I hadn't explored my American side of the hyphen as much as my Cuban side. There had always been some small part of me that didn't really feel American. The true American boy seemed like someone else, not me exactly. Perhaps I had subscribed to the mindset of my exile community, which saw their lives here only as temporary. America was home, but not a permanent one. Just as my parents wanted to return to their island paradise, perhaps all along I had wanted to return to the paradise of that America I had idealized since grade school, though both were just as imaginary, just as unreachable. So again, you see the poets have already arrived at these understandings of when we become what we become. And a lot of that has to do through context, through tragedies sometimes will help us uh, uh, to, to feel a sense of belonging. And a lot of travel, I think, does it, does it also. Uh, Wang Wai Wei died in the year 761, so we can see that these questions of self have been with us for a long time. The poem closes with these lines. Appearances emerges Appearance emerges from chance conditions, and our true natures empty, kindred to nothing. So how do you know an ancient recluse master? Not by the old timer's form he somehow took on. In another poem, Wang Wei says, each year on this auspicious day, alone and foreign, here in a foreign place, my thoughts of you sharpen. He died in 761. And he was an internal exile, in a way. Um, the Zen poets, like Wei, wrote beautifully about movement and travel and wandering. And I've taken the title of tonight's talk uh, from Matsuo Basho, the Japanese uh, haiku uh, poet and traveler who was born uh, near Kyoto in 1644. Um, some of the travel sketches are collected, and I wonder if I brought, oh yes, I did bring it also. This is my night to push poetry. Um, the, the narrow road to the deep north. And I'll, I'll quote a little bit from that as well. Days and months are travelers of eternity. So are the years that pass by. Those who steer a boat across the sea or drive a horse over the earth till they succumb to the weight of years, spend every minute of their lives traveling. There are a great number of ancients, too, who died on the earth. I myself have been tempted for a long time by the cloud-moving wind, filled with a strong desire to wander. <coughs> so this is not a new phenomenon. Uh, Beowulf, it's the old English poem that everybody's forced to read in high school. How many of you have been forced to read this poem? It's fantastic. Read it again when you have <laughs> some years on you, probably. Um, it was written down in England in the year 975, but it takes place in Denmark and Sweden. And uh, Jorge Luis Borges gives a, a series of le wonderful lectures about this, and he, he loved to, to note things uh, kind of wryly. Uh, and he, he notes this irony that the poem's an English poem, but it takes place in Denmark and Sweden. And he says in this lecture, this indicates that after 300 years living in new lands, the Anglo-Saxons still felt homesick for their old homelands on the Baltic Sea. So that's a new way of looking at Beowulf, right? It's exile poetry. <laughs> uh, closer to our era, Derek Walcott, in 1979, writes in the schooner flight, I have only one theme, the bowsprit, the arrow, the longing, the lunging heart, the flight to a target whose aim we'll never know. Vain search for one island that heals with its harbor and a guiltless horizon where the almond shadow doesn't injure the sand. Beautiful. Um, I also reminded of Edwidge Danticat, who was just here. Great friend, great writer, and a wonderful human being. She writes in one of her books, Exile is not for everyone. Someone has to stay behind to receive the letters and greet family members when they come back. And then there's a great South African poet, Brighton Breitenbach, who was my mentor at NYU, uh, who wrote, the exile lives abroad the way the moon lives in the lake. The poetry of exile could fill a graduate seminar uh, 
which I'm not going to turn this into, uh, although it would make a great graduate seminar by somebody. <laughs> somebody should do it. Uh, so I'll stop by quoting a writer that you've probably never heard of. Um, Fred Flegger. Anybody heard of him? Um, the only thing I'm able to find out about him is that he was born in Kansas City in 1909. And in 1961, he published this book, Red Tag Comes Back. And I was obsessed with this book as a kid. I just could not get enough of it. And everybody made fun of me for, for, for this. And it, it was a, one of the things that was lost in our many moves. I was telling Michael before the talk that I want to write an essay, all the things I've lost in my moves. <laughs> And th this was one of them. My sister found it on eBay for me at Christmas, and she gave it to me. So it was just a, a great, uh, a great book. And uh, once I read it again uh, as an adult, uh, with a new understanding of literature and psychology and all of those things, I understand why it had this this grip on me. It's it's about a salmon um, that gets tagged as a little spawn and uh, then begins the journey of his life away from his home and encounters all sorts of treacherous things on the way out and then uh, one day for reasons that of course are unexplainable to the salmon uh, she decides to turn back for the place of her birth and then the journey back uh, inexplicable as it is is also full of uh, treacherous uh, fish want to eat her, fisherman, a bear comes out at her. Uh, it's really, you know, you're on the edge of your seat with this book. <laughs> and um, so I'll read you from this book as well. Uh, now Red Tag is almost home. Just above the falls is where she was born. See, on top of everything, she has to deal with the dam now. She jumps, but she falls back. Can she jump the falls? Again, she jumps. She jumps high this time. Up and up she goes, but she does not make it. She falls back again. There you have her picture. Sam. Um, well, uh, here in this simple literary style of the I Can Read books um, is a meditation on Basho's uh, Cloud Moving Wind. It is an existential a piece on the journey home. And it was a journey that my parents were very much in the grip of when I was obsessed with this book uh, in the 70s and, and still planning to go back and still trying to make their way past the hungry bears and the fishermen and the dams and all of those other things to, to go back home. Um, all four of my grandparents were born uh, elsewhere of parents who had been themselves born elsewhere. And they spent uh, the second half of their lives waiting to be reunited with the first half. And they all died and are buried here uh, in Florida, away from home. And this is the story. And, and it's not a unique story by any means, even though uh, growing up I thought Cubans had a very unique story. Uh, it is the story of the 20th century. And, and, and it is one of the happier <laughs> stories of the 20th century, in fact. Um, I'll close by reading a few, few paragraphs, as I promised, uh, from my most recent book. This is the nice thing about organizing your own talk. You get to be in the company of Basho and Wang Wei and <laughs> Richard Blanco and all these great people. So uh, I will now read just a little bit from this um, opening of a, the last story in here called The Shunting Cranes Trace Iron Labyrinths, and that's uh, from a poem of Borges, the title. I boarded the train and took the last empty seat by the window. Outside, it was snowing. There was an announcement in three languages, none of which I understood. The woman next to me was eating a bowl of black beans. Seeing my confusion, she turned to me and said, this train goes to the coast. I thanked her. More people came on board. There was shouting and more, and there was shouting and more shoving. Men were forced to stand in the aisles. After a while, the car began to move. On the platform, those left behind shook their fists. 
Two men in long coats ran along the edge, waving at the conductor and pointing to the car where I sat. They wore identical black hats and looked like brothers, except one was bearded and the other hairless. I understood then that they would follow me wherever I went, would follow me unto death. Outside, dawn had returned, but brought with it little light. The sky was low and gray, though still studded with faint candlelight. The train picked up speed. Dirty snow was piled along both sides of the tracks. We were moving through a bare landscape empty of trees and homes. The only structures were enormous steel pylons arranged in rows going into the smoky distance. The woman pointed to the place where the parallel rows met and said, that's where we're going. Her name was Gertrude. I repeated the name to her, but she said she had never seen me before, that I must have her confused with someone else. She had come from a city farther north and had been traveling for several days, trying to reach the coast like the others. Everyone here is an emigrant, she explained. We're all going to the same place. The train rocked and I slept. After an indefinite time, I was woken by another announcement repeated in the same three strange languages. I waited for Gertrude to translate, but she didn't. I asked her how they passed the time on the train only waiting, she said, and sometimes they play a movie. She pointed to the tattered screens hanging at the front of the car. But it's always the same one. Three times a day, by however a day was measured, the dining car opened, Gertrude told me. They always served the same thing. After a time, I asked Gertrude the question I feared the most. When will we be arriving? Gertrude shrugged. It's up to the conductor. Who is the conductor? No one knows, she replied. Before she fell asleep, she said, some of us have been traveling for years, and we still don't know. I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much. from so <laughs> so thank you for that uh, and thank you to all of you who do teach the book and who have read it and enjoyed it I'm very grateful and uh, every now and then I get messages uh, emails from students uh, sometimes they want me to help them write their paper which I <laughs> never do that um, but but a lot of times I want to know well how did you get started how did you how did you write this how did you get the idea for this and I'm always delighted to answer so please you know, feel free to be in touch, uh, and, and thank you to Anna and to all, all the other uh, here who teach, and to Asha as well, who teach the books. So I think we're going to do a Q&A now. Well, I am so happy to be here with Anna. Um, I've been teaching for many years, and I've been teaching for Shepard, and I've taught in post-modern novel, I've taught in literary theory, I've taught in Twitter, I've taught in Twitter, I've taught in Twitter, I've taught in Twitter, Talk. That was really, really great. Um, what would you say to uh, to the generation three, um, like the generation of your son and pretty much my generation, people my age, um, that sometimes it's easy for them to forget, uh, you know, where their grandparents came from, and uh, how do you think uh, they identify themselves as Cubans or as Americans? Do they? I, I, that's a good question that I have for you. Do, does that generation? Uh, yeah, because even this is again blows my mind. With my own students, I am old enough to be your mother. Um, but, <laughs> and, and, but yes, I've always wanted to ask: uh, Do you still identify? Because when I was growing up uh, in Miami, and people would ask me, "What are you?" I would say Cuban. I wouldn't even say Cuban American. Um, and I'm curious: What is it for your generation? Do you say Cuban? Do you say American? Well, you... people ask me, and uh, I say I'm American uh, from. Cuban parents and Cuban grandparents, um, but I, a lot of my friends who are also in my situation, you know, they weren't brought up as strongly in, you know, the Cuban culture. They just say I'm American, and you know, they don't even speak Spanish, things like wow. that. So it, it, it really varies. So uh, it's yeah, this is how fast it goes. This is why these people who get all worked up about these.
immigrants have to learn English, really the tragedy is that they learn it too well and that the kids forget it. That is the real tragedy. Um, and so what I would say is what I said at the beginning was sit down with your grandparents and sit down with that generation that came and listen to their stories. Um, it sometimes it's hard, you know, I mean, when we were growing up, my sister and I would roll our eyes when my parents would start talking about Cuba, and you know, everything was better in Cuba. The chocolate was better in Cuba, you know. <laughs> if you threw a seed out the, the window, it would start growing, you know. <laughs> and and you just, you get, you get sick of it. But in fact, uh, listen to those stories because they strike you as hokey now, and they'll be very poignant as you get older. And, 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 and stories are such a, uh, such a gift, and, and ask, ask them to tell you stories, and write them down. It's one of the things that I wish that I would have done with my grandmother, is written them down. Even the crazy things that she said, I wish I would have written them down, because they fade from memory. And, uh, and she would, if nothing else, she would have been a great character, um, because she was such a unique personality. So, um, and they wanted to tell you the story. That's something that I learned in journalism as well. People want to tell you their stories. Oh, the Mendes. Well, that's my grandmother's name. Yeah, um, my grandparents, uh, my great grandparents, who came from Syria and Lebanon. Uh, they changed their name, or they had their name changed to Mendes. This is apart from Menendez, which is on my dad's side. Um, they had their name changed to Mendes, and we don't even really know what the original was. Uh, my great grandmother's name was Nader, um, but my great grandfather's name, we don't really know what it was. Uh, we just know that it was changed to Mendes. And part of it was immigration, of course, they couldn't read the Arabic, and they said, What's your name? and they said something, and they said, Mendes. Um, but, but I think part of it also was that they, uh, they also wanted to be Cuban. They did not want to be Moros. Right? This is what the, the Lebanese were called. And, um, and they, the whole life it was like, we're not, you know, we're not going to be Moros, we're Mendes. And so many, many, many years later, I found myself in Hoboken, and I, I was working on a story um, on uh, domino players in Hoboken and in New Jersey. And uh, there was almost never anybody that I met who was from Guinness, which is where my mom is from. It's a little town outside of Havana. Is anybody here from Guinness? Guineros. Maybe you remember Los Mendes. Yeah, but they sold clothes. You said there were lots of Mendes in Guinness. Yes. But they had a clothing store. They had a clothing store also, but he had a butcher shop, my, 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 my uh, great-grandfather. But when I told this to the Guineros there who were playing dominoes, uh, I said, Mendes, he said, no, los únicos Mendes en Guine eran moros. <laughs> You know, the, people the other word was Polacos. Polacos. Yeah, that was the other word for, or Turcos. Uh, they also called because they were traveling under the Turkish uh, passport. Yeah, so they couldn't escape. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot to tell that story. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, what inspired you to write about Cuba? Yeah. Because you said Oh, I think it can be very funny also. Uh, and there's a lot of exiles who tell very funny stories. My, my uncle, who's a doctor, tells hilarious stories about Cuba and, and things that they would do to other, you know. I mean, he, he talks, I mean, things that you would do to people now, correr máquina, you know, to run, uh, to do, how do you say that in English, correr máquina? Um, well, yeah, to do pranks, yeah, to, to prank people. And, and they were working as uh, medical students and, um, you know, to, to like do a prank on their friend, they called the, um, the people who take care of, of the insane uh, to come and, and pick up this guy who was saying that he was a fellow student. <laughs> and that, you know, he wouldn't leave and he kept saying, you know, I belong here, I'm a student. And, you know, they needed to, he was, they thought he was dangerous and they needed to get rid of him. <laughs> 
So, you know, the guys in the truck came, you know, with the padded truck and everything, and, and you know, the guy's screaming, I'm a student, I belong here. <laughs> so, and these are the stories that my uncle, Jesus, tells, and, he, and he, he's not prone to telling nostalgic stories. To him, everything's a big joke. So, it, it, there is a possibility of that, of telling funny stories, and I think it's another way of processing, of transforming, and it's one of the beautiful things about storytelling is that it has this ability to transform events, to take even events that were tragic or that were embarrassing. One of, the, one of the exercises that I have my students do is to remember an embarrassing moment, a super embarrassing moment in their life that they kept ruminating on, and to write it. And everybody groans about it. And then it's often the most hilarious stories that you remember. And then they all say afterwards, I'm not even embarrassed about it anymore. You know, now that I see it, it's actually funny. And so storytelling has this transformative quality, uh, which is very powerful, and it's a very powerful way of ordering experience. And I think it's it's one of our adaptive abilities. Right? And what a beautiful thing it is that we can do that <coughs> as human beings, that we can take memories and, and make them into entertainment. And so it's not just nostalgia, although a lot of it will naturally fall into that category. Um, but the, it's very rich for all sorts of other things. Yeah. Um, when, when you write, how much is fueled by your family, like your grandparents, like you said, because I, I relate to that a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and how much is fueled by your own personal experiences of like, maybe displacement, if you feel that? Yeah, it depends. Uh, it depends on what I'm writing and, and uh, Things, I, I mean, I, I don't believe that the characters take over, I don't believe that kind of stuff, but I do believe that uh, stories begin to take a life of their own, which is not really of their own, it's of yourself. It's what's in you that you haven't accessed in any other way. Um, and so something may start off as a character sketch of somebody I know, but then just becomes something else. Uh, um, I think. One of, the, one of the freeing things of leaving journalism is that finally I could, I could lie and I could embellish, you know, because always during stories, uh, no, this would be a good story if only he had said this and this, or, you know, of course you can't do that as a journalist, but finally when you get, do, get to fiction, you can have them kind of awesome quotes or funny things or whatever. And, and so it's a process that we don't really understand, right? And there's all sorts of fights in writing circles about where writing comes from, you know, is it you have to work at it, or is it you just the news comes down and shines on you, uh, and it really, it's different for everybody, and it's even different for a person book to book and story to story. Some, some stories that I've written, I've, I've written in a burst of what we would call inspiration, and others I've had to revise endlessly, 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 and they turn out to be better stories, so go figure. Yeah. as a state of rootedness. I like that. I like that. The sense of constant movement as a way of staying still. Uh, and I, 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 Mark Strand has a poem that says, I move to keep things whole. Um, and I, I think it gets at that. And I think I understand that poem now, <laughs> after your question. Um, yes, in a way, uh, constantly moving not only gives you a sense of place, but it also gives you a sense of identity. Uh, and, and it's perhaps an identity that I wouldn't have any other way. 
uh, I am the person who moves all the time. And, and you become a kind of mythic figure in the family, right? This is my cousin, the traveler. This is how my cousin always introduces me. Um, does that give you the same sense of permanence as staying in one place? Obviously not, right? Um, but then the second part of your question dealt with poetry, and poetry being it's kind of a, of a mediating uh, uh, art form in a sense, where it takes experience, it takes memory, it mediates it into, into another form. And I think, I think poetry is, uh, well, I say this as a non-poet, I think it's one of the highest art forms. And it's something that I, I aspire to, but, but I'm not there. And that's why I admire people like Richard Blanco so much, because they are able to capture uh, a state of being in a, in, a, in a way that's closer to music, perhaps, than it is to, to narrative. By capturing that state of being in poetry, would you ever say that poetry can create a space in which the rhythmics can also exist because you're creating a reality in writing? Yes, I suppose, in a sense, right? A poem becomes uh, its own reality um, and, and, and its own truth, also. And in some ways, and that's what poetry aspires to, I think, is to, to dig at, uh, at, at, a, at a, uh, maybe felt truth, but unarticulated. And I think that's what touches us about poetry, right? Where we, we um, in fact, Richard Blanco talks about this, where he says uh, in this book, I'll, I'll plug it again, for me, uh, where he says uh, that he sees poetry as a mirror where the poet and the reader uh, catch each other in a sort of foggy reflection. I'm not doing justice to the way he put it, but I can't find it now. Um, but, but the sense of it's a mirror and, and the, the, the reader catches his own or her own reflection in the poem, even with the face of the poet there. And I think that's what moves us. Uh, when we read poetry, even poetry as old as as uh, Wang Wei, you know, who's writing in seven, died in 761, and he's saying identity is only the role we play in public. And wow, that's still true, and even if we can't articulate it. That way. Um, you put a lot of emphasis on on your identity as a poet, and I question though because um, that it's a natural question right when we say you have to write down your stories and so forth um, in a way it's I wish we had a word in English for community biographical right that is <laughs> it's not my story but it's our story it's the story that I grew up with and it's the story that I wanted to tell not in its individual to me sense but what I saw and, and the, my first book grew out of that need to, because I, I was writing in, uh, I wrote, I started writing that book in 1997. And then as now, you know, the Cubans have a kind of a checkered reputation outside of Miami, maybe even inside Miami, as being a little bit emotive, and, <laughs> shall we say, uh, and you know, unreasonable and insane and obsessed and all of these things, uh, which are true uh, to a certain extent. Uh, but I wanted to give the context for that. Uh, and, and it's not that I wrote with an agenda, but as a storyteller, and I had been a journalist, and I felt that as a journalist, I wasn't able to do it. I was trying, and I wasn't able to do it. And through fiction, I was able to say, OK, yeah, these people are crazy. All they do is talk about their, you know, how better the chocolate was. Blah, blah, blah. But this is why. And to give them, to give in, in, in a fictional format a glimpse of those lives that are private and that are not shared with people on CNN, you know, who grabs the, you know, craziest abuela they can find for their, you know, three second quote, right? 
those people who are listening to that haven't peered into her life to say, well, she, you know, had to leave everything behind. She couldn't bring her wedding ring. She couldn't bring her diploma. You know, she never saw her parents again. They don't know that context of it. And so that's what I want fiction. That's what I want, especially that first book to be, is context. And, and not necessarily to make, to make you fall in love with them or, you know, form any opinions other than the way that we tend to be with our families. You know, we tend to be pretty forgiving of our families, quirks and things, because we know the context. And so that was born out of that. And, you know, my dad doesn't have a restaurant. My dad was a uh, uh, high executive in the telephone companies, an engineer. And, you know, it, it's not my life, but it is, by extension. You know, so. um, could you give me the reasons why you believe there's such a sharp contrast between your great-grandparents um, wanting to assimilate and accept Cuba uh, and leave the past behind towards your grandmother, who never really fully embraced the United States. And, um, could you, would you rather attribute that to conditions or individual personalities? That's a good question. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I think for uh, my grandmother and her generation and people of her generation, it was critical mass. And so they had so many people here in Miami um, that it made it easy for them to continue as if nothing happened mm -hmm. and they were still over there. And you know, it, the weather's the same. <laughs> the stores were named the same. You know, people brought their stores, and you see these things, these store names that say, you know, established in 1855. Well, in Havana, maybe. <laughs> And, and so that critical mass, I think, made it easy for them to continue in community. Whereas my great-grandparents, they had a, a small Arabic community, but it was much more uh, diffuse. It wasn't as many people. So that might be, it might be a very simple explanation, right? That it just, they didn't have the critical numbers. But I think also our idea of immigration and exile has changed. And I think that there's there's more acceptance of hanging on. Uh, there's not this dualism that, that you know either you assimilate to assimilate, you just forget everything. You know that there's a more of an acceptance of you can be American and still speak Spanish or still speak Chinese or still you know, and and I think that's that's a lovely thing. That, that I mean I wish that my great grandparents had taught my grandmother Arabic and had taught my mother Arabic and then I could speak it. And of course it's a selfish reason. I don't it's too hard to study now and I wish that somebody would have spoken it to me as a kid. But I think that our idea of immigration has changed and I don't know why that is. I mean there could be a million reasons. Uh, one of them is that travel is so easy now also you can go back and forth. Um, when my great grandparents left at the end of the breakup of the of the Ottoman Empire, at the end of the First World War uh, well, I mean, you left and that was it. You, you weren't going to go back. You weren't going to fly back. Um, you weren't going to talk on FaceTime with your cousins. Uh, and it was over. It was just acknowledged this was a traumatic thing. They came after us. You know, they took everything we had. We don't want anything to do with them anymore. And we're starting fresh. What was the mentality? It does in a way, right? Because um, you know, my dad, when he's arguing politics with me, his trump card is, "Well, you don't like the Cubans, anyways." <laughs> <laughs> um, so he knows it's there also, right? Because it's the sense of uh, if you don't, it, it, it's kind of it's kind of George Bush's uh, philosophy, right? You're with us or you're against us. And it's this, this very strict, you know, we don't accept halfway. Uh, you have to be on board or else you hate, you hate us. Um, and and it's, it's part of the character, unfortunately. And uh, I talk uh, sometimes about how the, the political uh, character uh, is, is shot through the whole society. It's not just the government, it's also the way the families are organized. Um, I went to hear a, a wonderful Dominican writer talking about um, you know,
know, how in the home they couldn't speak against the father. You know, you couldn't say anything bad against dad because he would get mad. And, and so this is a part of the culture. And so that is part of it, I think, which is that you either accept it or you don't. Or you're, you're, you're on board with this program or you're not. And so it is something that I struggle with because uh, I feel, well, always as a child, I felt very Cuban. And I feel that it's a very important part of my heritage. And I speak to my son in Spanish only. Uh, my little three-year-old doesn't speak any English. Um, and, and so that's an important thing for me. And I do wonder, well, where is it that I fit in here uh, on this spectrum? But luckily, I think that, that America has been very, very good to us. <laughs> America has been very, very good to us. Um, <laughs> in that sense, that it, it has given us it has given us a, a, a sense of there's more possibilities, that you, you have a spectrum now, that you can disagree. Uh, and, I, and I find that that's the case more and more, and, and even within my own family, that, that you know, dissidents are tolerated and um, you know, nobody's being attacked and, and things like that. And I think that's part of, part of living in this country for a long time. I think it has been a, a good influence, at least in my own family. I'm not going to generalize, but for my own family, which tended to be very strict in its orthodoxy, um, I think it's been a fairly good thing. Well, first I want to thank you. Your words and your novels and your essay are super inspirational. Thank you for coming. Um, wise observation because I think we're not just creating the stories, we're creating ourselves in the telling of the stories and who we are and what we believe. And, and sometimes that only comes out through the stories. So I think absolutely. And uh, a lot of times I found myself writing about Cuba when I was really writing about my childhood, uh, but using those same feelings. And, and I remembering, I mean even now, I remember my uh, godparents' house in Westchester and we would sit on the back uh, porch and chew sugar cane. And it seems to be like a memory that happened in Cuba, which I didn't grow up in. <laughs> so, you know, in that sense, memory itself is a kind of storytelling. Uh, but I found myself drawing on those same feelings uh, of, of, of missing. And Richard Walker talks about that as well, that, you know, it's the childhood uh, that you create for yourself that you that you miss, and that becomes part of, of part of your adulthood and part of your stories in that sense, yeah. And we are creating, we're creating the self all the time. Uh, it, it's, uh, identity is a role we play in public, and that is also creative, yeah. Uh, yeah, I have a, a two-part question. Um, so you say, you say Cubans or, or exiles uh, focus on the uh, negative, uh, so my question is, what is... Um, I don't know if I quite say that, but going on. I think you said that in the beginning. I mean, that's, that's yeah. what I heard. Um, so what are the um, positive things um, that, that you say uh, about being in, in exile, maybe for your personality, or, uh, your character, the way you think about problems in the world, the way you think about politics, perhaps? Um, and my second question is... Um, <coughs> Did the salmon make it over the dam? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you'll have to buy the book. <laughs> yes, he comes home. She comes home and she lays her eggs, and then of course she dies. <laughs> but she does make it over the dam. That was the easy part of the question. Um, no, it, I, I think you're getting the negative thing from what uh, Dave read earlier on from the book, and it's from this kind of crazy woman who um, is into. A positive thinking and she's trying to get her, her uh, friends to think positively. So she's saying, you know, all we Cubans focus on is the negative, we look at, need to look at the positive. Um, I, don't, I don't see it all as negative, obviously. Uh, I, my culture has fantastic things and I remember when I was living in uh, Hoboken, I would now and then get on the bus and hear Cuban Spanish and my heart would melt and there would be these little old men that would be speaking Cuban Spanish and I'm just like, 
Um, wonderful things. I mean, I'm not going to be a cheerleader here, but I could be. Um, uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, passion that we have for each other and for helping, I think, is our main, uh, it's something that really helped us thrive, you know, where we would come, uh, people came in those first waves, people had no credit history, and if you would just lend, people would be lent money based on their reputation in Cuba. It's a close-knit community uh, that, thanks to that, was able to build a network that could thrive in a lot of ways. Uh, some of the funniest people um, I know, just uh, willing to make a joke out of anything, uh, and, and that eases suffering, you know, and eases pain and loss and all of those things. I learned uh, all those things from from uh, from growing up Cuban, you know, how to tell stories. I mean, I remember as a child, uh, somebody would always bring out the guitar. Right? Do people still do this? Somebody would always bring out the guitar and somebody would recitar. <laughs> and you have to sit there and listen, right? Uh, but it's lovely. It's a, it's a, and poetry also is very important uh, for me, and I think it is for, for most Cubans. It's, a, it's not something fancy that you do in graduate school. It's something that you are born into, and that is very much a part of life and culture, and uh, you, you know, you see that at parties, and you know, you know, they bring out the guitar, and you're just not afraid of it. So it's a, a kind of living with that that uh, I'm very grateful. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm going to squeeze out maybe one more. I know everyone wants a longer question, but if you don't want to keep running here. I can keep, I can keep going. <laughs> Peter can tell you that I can talk forever. I prefer this to writing. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, just first a comment it, with, in your nonfiction persona. I used to read your columns in the Herald and I really thought they were terrific. And when I sent you an email, which I think I did maybe two or three times. I remember you, we met somewhere also uh, here at FIU. Yeah. Well, I have a kind of face. You might, might not. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, were always, you always responded and you were very gracious. I really appreciated that. Yeah, you know, thank you. Know, Anyway, um, I think this is more like an observation that maybe you could confirm. It seems to me that people who leave, whether it's for travel or, or because of exile, develop a sensitivity to place that it, a, a lot of people never get. And that sounds very obvious, and I don't just mean physical place, but I do mean physical place too. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also that part of that might be the literary sensibility because literature is a place you carry with you. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and um, I'm not saying this too well, but I mean, uh, there's really two things going on there. But, but I mean, I bet when you travel, there are certain things that you do to become accustomed to your place. Um, yeah, I think so, and I, I, I also love it. I mean, this is something that I've always loved. I think this is also something you're born into. Uh, I remember being a kid, and, and we would move to a new house, and I was so excited. Uh, to think of new rooms, new layout, new furniture. It really excited me, the idea of a new place. Where some people become very anxious about a new place. So I think there's a personality uh, component to that. Um, but then yes, then what, what becomes your place is the excitement of, I'm gonna discover something new. And this is always, I remember moving to a new place and going through the unfamiliar streets and I always had the thought, Someday I'll get this. I'll figure this out. And it's exciting to, to anticipate that. And so you also notice things that people who have lived in one place for a long time don't notice anymore. Uh, and that is very important as a writer because we're, you're an observer. You're kind of a professional observer as a writer. And by constantly moving, at least this is what I tell myself, I'm keeping myself uh, supple in, in the observations because you get dead to a place if you've been there for too long. You just don't even notice it. I, I mean, I, I wonder if, if people who live in Miami even notice the traffic, not to keep you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it really strikes me. Every time I come back, it's so much worse. Um, yeah, and, and, and the flooding on the beach also is another thing that I've noticed that it ha happens more and more. So, and, and this is true of any place, you know, you just notice quirks in people, you notice quirks, uh, types of personalities or types in the culture that I think once you live there a long time, it just becomes, you know, you don't even notice them anymore. 